Uh, okay, so um, let's uh, uh, start. So I'm, I'm uh, uh, very happy to that uh, to have with us uh, this uh, in this occasion of the analysis and the geometry seminar at uh, Universitat Catolica de Chile uh, to have uh, um, Ariana Junti from Imperial College London. So. Uh, let me tell you a little bit. So Ariana was uh, uh, doing her, we, we know each other from your PhD when you were at Max Planck Institute in Leipzig. And, uh, um, and now I think after that you went in Bonn for uh, one or two years, I, I, I'm not sure, in another postdoc. And uh, uh, now we are in Imperial College, right? So, yeah. Uh, a post, a, 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 how is it? A fellowship uh, postdoc in called Chapman Fellowship. Is it correct? I, fi I found that online. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So yeah, well, anyway, so thank you very much for agreeing. And uh, uh, the title of the talk is uh, homogenization in randomly perforated domains. Okay. So thank you very much, Mircha, for the introduction, for the invitation, and thanks everyone for coming today. So um, I'm very happy to be able to, to give a talk here. I mean, of course, I mean, online things are always not as nice maybe as in person, but at least allow us to, you know, like talk to each other with a, a notion in the middle. Um, so indeed, what I'm going to uh, talk about today are some um, homogenization results uh, for some random PDEs. And I will uh, try to uh, explain to you where the randomness comes into play. Um, and in particular, let's say in what are usually called perforated domains. So what I'm going to talk about today uh, are joint works with uh, Richard Höfer and uh, Juan Velázquez. So one is in Paris and the other one is in Bonn. And I mean, so what I will do, since I don't know how familiar are people with homogenization, I will try to uh, give you, let's say, a soft introduction to homogenization, at least uh, for let's say the kind of problem that I'm introducing here and then proceed to uh, give you the main results and then hopefully have some time to uh, give you a sketch and some idea of the proof. Okay, so uh, let's start. Uh, so the kind of problems that I'm considering today are problems of this form. So as you see here, what I'm studying is a, a boundary value problem. So I'm in a certain domain, and I will say more about this later. I am considering the Dirichlet boundary conditions on this domain, and I'm taking a PDE where L is a second order differential operator, elliptic, and in this talk, it will mainly be either the Laplacian, so I'm considering, let's say, a, a scalar problem in some sense, or the Stokes operator. Uh, so I'm considering this problem in a domain which I call the epsilon, which is a puncture domain. And by puncture domain, I mean this. So I'm giving this talk uh, in R3, but I can basically work in any dimension, but this is, let's say, the physical dimension. So I construct this puncture domain, the epsilon, in the following way. So I take a subset of R3D, which is an open bounded domain, and then basically I remove from this set uh, collection of holes, which I call H epsilon. And the drawing is basically the, let's say, prototypical example. So the holes, the set H epsilon are the red holes here, and my domain D is the blue one. So what is this uh, collection of holes? So how are the holes? Uh, basically, uh, this is a collection like in the set, uh, sorry, like in the picture of the holes, which have the following typical length scales, right? So H, I mean, I have an epsilon here, which characterizes the length scales of my holes, uh, which are the following ones. So the first one is uh, the distance between the holes, which I assume to be of order epsilon. So basically this side, I mean, this length scale here. And then I have another uh, length scale, which I enslave to epsilon and which I call A epsilon which is the size of the holes. And in this case, since they are uh, both the diameter of the holes. Uh, now, uh, 
one of the main reasons you want to study this kind of problem, right? So the, the, what we are interested in, as you might imagine, will be what happens when I uh, send epsilon to zero in my boundary value problem. And of course, when I send epsilon to zero, since the distance, uh, the typical distance between the holes is getting smaller and smaller, I'm considering more and more holes, which are also becoming smaller and smaller. So many, basically the limit I'm interested in is the limit of many small holes in my domain. Now, why would I like to study uh, this kind of problem? So uh, problems of this kind arise in different applications, mainly, let's say, uh, from the applied point of view, let's say from the uh, physical literature point of view, uh, you see this kind of problems uh, when it comes to understanding the flow of a fluid in a porous medium. So in particular, if uh, my problem here is a Stokes problem, so right, I mean, here I am basically uh, considering, let's say stationary Stokes, so a problem of this form, divergence free and zero boundary conditions in my domain, the epsilon. So you might interpret this problem as studying the motion of a viscous fluid uh, among this spheric, I mean, this solid fault, right? And one example could be the motion, for instance, of water through sands or water uh, through grains uh, of a particular rock. So this is basically the main, uh, uh, let's say, application where you want to study problems of this kind, uh, or a similar problem could be if my particles are not the grains of the sand, but are particular, so are other kind of solid particles which are sedimenting in the fluid with a velocity which is much smaller uh, than the velocity of the fluid. So basically these are the main problems where um, boundary value, uh, boundary value problem of this kind might arise. Uh, uh, now, excuse me. Uh, sure. it, in, in the in the Stokes problem, uh, u u epsilon sub e uh, is a vector valued function, or maybe that's irrelevant. Yes. But okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, exactly. So your u epsilon basically goes from two or three. Yes. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Definitely. Um, yes, and I mean the same could be so for the Laplacian. Of course, you consider the scalar, or you can consider also the the case of a, a vectorial function. That's the same, but uh, of course, I mean, in the case of Stokes, this is a, a vector field. It's your, the velocity of your fluid indeed. Okay, so um, where does homogenization come from? Well, uh, indeed, I mean, what I'm interested in, as I was saying, is what happens when I'm studying a PD of this form and I send epsilon to zero. So I have many small holes in my domain. Now, I mean, the, the main, uh, indeed, the main analogy or the main application is indeed the, 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 the case of fluid in sand, right? And what is the, the idea there? So in some sense, what your PD is trying to uh, model is the motion of your fluid through the grains of sand. And of course, this might be a very complex uh, problem to solve, right? Because you are solving uh, a partial differential equation uh, in particular, you're solving Stokes, so you need like good bounds on the pressure, uh, on the velocity, in a domain which is very involved. I have many small holes, so my domain, for instance, is not simply connected, and the holes that are appearing in the, in the domain are very close, and many of them. So, of course, this could be a prob problematic, let's say, both from the analytical point of view and the numerical point of view. However, I mean, what happens in application is that if you're interested into the motion of your fluid into the sand, uh, not when you look, uh, when you zoom in, let's say, around each grain of sand, but you want to understand, let's say, the overall motion of your fluid. So in some sense, you want to uh, describe the behavior of the, velo the velocity at the scale of the system, for instance, at, at the scale of the observer, at the scale where the size of the grain of sand is much bigger, so which would correspond to sending epsilon to zero, it turns out that you can solve and that you can describe your fluid by a much simpler problem. And this is indeed what happens. So this is basically the mathematical 
uh, still quite, I mean, heuristic <laughs> so far way of saying what I just said, right? I mean, homogenization is telling you that you take this problem. This problem is multi-scale. So you have one microscopic scale, which is given by epsilon, which would be basically the size distance of the grains of sand. And you have a macroscopic scale, which is the scale of your full domain D and the scale usually of the right-hand side. And now what homogenization tells you is that when these two scale separate, so when the micro scale becomes small enough, this problem here can be approximated by another problem, which is usually simpler. So why is it simpler? As you see here, the holes do disappear. So now I'm solving a new problem in a domain which is much nicer. Now, of course, so far I haven't said anything about this operator here, right? And let's say nothing tells me that this should be the original operator. So this is basically what you would expect from homogenization, what you expect from application. But of course, if you have to uh, really like give the mathematical rigorous proof, you need to uh, understand like some first fundamental questions. Of course, the first one is what does this really mean? So in which kind we in which kind of convergence we have, in which cases do we have this? I mean, which kind of assumptions we need to put on my holes? Of course, also in which regimes, right? Because I keep talking about epsilon, but I also have the parameter A epsilon. So epsilon was only the distance between the holes. And of course, I can pick, oh, sorry. I can pick for the size. I don't know why this is happening. <laughs> a size which depends on epsilon. It could be, for instance, a power of epsilon for some power alpha bigger than one, or at least one. And according to this kind of different regimes, I might have a different uh, result. And this is indeed what happens. And then, of course, I mean, after I mean, understanding whether homogenization takes place, the, the second question or like the, the, the connected question is, what is this operator here? So how, I I, how do I describe the effective homogenized equation? So how does this operator L hat depend on the geometry of my holes? So let me say in particular what I'm interested in, and in some sense, what is also a reasonable uh, way of model applications or porous median applications is the case of uh, what are called disordered medias. So when my, uh, the hole, so the set H epsilon, which perforates my domain uh, is random, right? This is somehow a, I'm a reasonable way of trying to model, for instance, a, a porous medium, so a certain rock or the grains of sand, because of course you do not expect that they are very ordered or periodic, but you do expect that uh, they, are randomly distributed according to a certain probability measure. Okay, so this is basically the problem. So the problem is to try to understand the uh, effective behavior of uh, uh, these boundary value problems here. Of course, as you might expect, homogenization and this operator will depend on certain geometrical properties of the holes. It might depend, for instance, I mean, one first guess could be uh, that the uh, volume ratio, which is uh, uh, given by the, the small holes in the full domain might play a role or other kind of uh, geometrical properties. So what it turns out is that the main uh, quantity that governs the homogenization behavior for these problems is the capacity. So, and when I say capacity, uh, at least in most of the cases, and I will uh, uh, comment more on this, I mean what is usually the harmonic capacity or the electrostatic capacity. So just to, 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 to recall, uh, for two sets, I mean, one in, in, inside the other, and let's say regular enough, the capacity of my set A, so the smaller one inside the bigger one, is the following basically optimization problem. So it's given by the infimum of the Dirichlet energy in the domain B for uh, taken over functions which are smooth and compactly supported in D and which are at least one on A. And of course, I mean, uh, 
I mean, okay, this is, it's not written here, but I mean, it's it's easy to see that the standard computation that it uh, it turns out that by uh, asking for I mean this optimization problem, the minimizer exists, and usually for at least regular uh, sets, it satisfies the Euler-Lagrange equation of this form. Uh, a, B minus A, and this is on the boundary of A, and this is on the boundary of B. I will say more about this later. Okay, uh, so what do I mean that the capacity governs the behavior? I think there is a, a raised hand. Yeah, uh, just a main side question, not really to do with the talk. But can you just give maybe, I mean, um, sometimes I find it difficult to I mean the computational uh, aspects of calculating these capacities. Do you know of some good references where I can like look at it and understand more? Maybe? Um, so you mean, okay, maybe so up. So by computing, you mean really like explicit? For example, computing. meaning, yeah, meaning. So I yeah. usually, I mean, <laughs> usually my go-to book for this kind of thing is the evans Garipi one. But this is, of okay. course, a very uh, kind of like introduces capacities or yeah. capacities in a kind of uh, more abstract way. Yeah. Uh, and this is in some sense, as I will try to explain the main uh, properties, I mean, the main things that you need to know in order to deal with this problem here. Um, maybe we can talk about it at the end of the talk. Uh, what do you mean exactly by it? Yeah, so, no, one of the things I would like to probably know is like, I, mean, I, I, I think it's true, but I'm not so clear. It's not so clear in my head. Um, so if you have, uh, for this capacity, I think if you have a code dimension two set, its capacity is zero or something like that. Is that true, right? Uh, can you repeat? Sorry, I, I couldn't hear. A, a, a set of core dimension two uh, has zero capacity. For example, if you have a point in 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 a plane. Ah, so this is what you're what you're asking. Uh, yeah. Okay. So you you usually have a bound on the a Hausdorff dimension if you mm. if you know that some capacities are zero. This is something yeah. that you have, yeah. uh, and this is I think it's d minus two for the two capacity. Okay. Uh, and for the p capacities d minus p this is a, this is a, okay. an implication in that direction i would okay. say yeah yeah okay thanks okay. sorry for the interruption <laughs> no worries um okay so um right so what do i mean that the capacity governs the limit behavior well what i mean is the following so let's say that i can give a meaning to the following basically measures. So I take any set in my domain. And then what I look at is the capacity generated by the holes inside this set. So only the ones contained in A. And I look at this limit here. So this would be basically like the limit of the density of the capacity. So if I manage to give a meaning to this mu, then basically the, let's say, rule of thumb or the what homogenization will tell me is that I do, I do have homogenization and my Laplacian converges in the limit to this operator here. So this is basically, at least for the Laplacian, the operator that I called um, hell hat in the previous slide. So more precisely, what I have is the following. So, and I, I, for now, I will comment only in the case of the Laplacian and then I will comment on Stokes. So whenever this mu is finite, so you can give a meaning to this limit and it has the right regularity, then basically what you expect and what you have in many cases is that your solution converges to the solution of the following effective equation. So as you see here, my holes are, have disappeared and basically the only memory of the holes which remains in the limit problem is the presence of this uh, element mu here. 
So the zero order, let's say, uh, term in my operator. And the same is, I mean, something can also be said in the case where the limit exists, but it's infinite. So if mu is infinite, so heuristically, what, what this tells you, right, is that basically this is the dominant term in the limit and the Laplacian, if you suitably rescale u epsilon, and I will comment more on this later, uh, will basically only converge to this operator here. So this is just this simple identity, right? Because I mean, in some sense, this will be the, no the dominant term and this Laplacian will disappear in the limit. And this is basically the same that happens for Stokes. Uh, so in the case of Stokes, basically the capacity that you need to consider is a similar capacity to the one above, but is basically the vectorial analog if you add also in the minimizers, the divergence free constraint. And I will uh, say more on this when I go to the proof. But what you have to think about is that in this case, the capacity is not scalar anymore, will be vectorial. And again, I take now vector fields, which have a certain, I mean, a property similar to this one, and they are also divergence free. And then the same holds also in the case of Stokes. So basically, if I start, if I give a meaning to density of capacity, and this will be a matrix in this case, and this is finite, my effective operator will be this, right? So if I start with Stoke, I have an additional term, which is a zero order term. This is what is usually called the Brinkman system. And if I have, in the case B, a blow up of the capacity, then I do have, again, as here, the following equation. And this is what is usually known in uh, physics and for fluids as Darcy's law. So this is the case where my fluid is basically flowing with the velocity, which is proportional to, of course, the source, gravity usually, and the gradient and the gradient of the pressure. Uh, I think there is another raised hand, I see. Yeah, the same person, yeah, I'm ah, sorry. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, there's a, a technical point here, I guess, right? Meaning probably we'll touch on it later, but uh, even sure, sure. to define this uh, operator would be on a different space. And I mean, the, you have to have a suitable notion of a meaning. The original might have been in a Sobel of space, but now you need to define a different kind of vectors. I mean, a function space for making sense of the solution to this equation, right? The limit um, equation. Actually not really, I mean, so it, it depends what you mean. So as you see here, so your- Because of I the measure mu. This. Yes, but this is something which is uh, pretty nice. Usually okay. you are in a bounded domain and you are also in H1 zero. But in any case, let me say that usually my mu will be a constant. So this wouldn't be a problem. And if your question was also related to the presence of the holes, of course, these guys here are in the domain, sorry, in the space H10 by definition, and the existence of the solution is not hard. But since they are, I mean, U epsilon are zero in the holes, they are simply, I mean, the, trivial extension zero inside the holes is also, you can also consider it in H10D. So you basically are only in the same function space of the limit equation. Yeah. And a similar thing can be done uh, for Victoria, for vector fields in, uh, in H10 here. Yeah, no, my worry was when mu is not a constant, it's some like maybe a quite a strange measure. Uh, yes, but as you see here, this is not so bad, right? I mean, you okay. need to be in W11. Okay. And you are because you are in a, in a bounded domain and you are H1. Okay. So Thank this you. is not a problem for the definition. In any case, I will, as you will see now, this will mostly be a constant. Okay. So not to, uh, maybe it's like an overkill to write that this is W minus one infinity. Okay, so as you see here, I mean, I have many references and I mean, there are even more uh, that work on this kind of problems and prove, I mean, these statements in a rigorous way. So where, I mean, 
you have like a rigorous proof of these convergences, both in the uh, scalar case on the, let's say the case of the Laplacian and in the case of Stokes. However, uh, the main difference, I mean, so what is missing yet, uh, and, and this is what I will talk about and with what I I'm focusing on, is the fact that in all these cases, the geometry of the holes is quite rigid. What do I mean by this? Well, I mean that uh, they either consider periodic case or random case, but where, let me go to the drawing before. So where, when I say that uh, epsilon, let's say, is the typical distance of the hole, and a epsilon is the typical size, when I mean typical, which of course is very general in this case, in all these models, it means that it's basically the distance between the holes and the size. So it's not typical in an average sense, but the models that are basically considered so far really do require that the two length scales are satisfied by all the holes. So for instance, it means that I'm not allowing uh, the holes to get too close to each other, and I'm not al allowing some of the holes to get too big. So I'm not allowing, for instance, clustering phenomena. So, and basically uh, what I am trying, I mean, what I will focus on is the following question. So we said, we just said that it's actually the density of capacity which should uh, govern the limit behavior. So I shouldn't need to have such rigid assumptions on the geometry of the holes. And in particular, if you think about many of the applications, uh, the porous media that I'm considering are random and there is no way, I mean, no reason why you need to ensure or you need to uh, ask that the distance is really always the same, always of the same size, and the size as well is really so regular. Actually, this is not usually happening. What you usually know on porous media are only certain statistical uh, quantities, so only uh, the length scales basically in expectation. So the question that I'm focusing on and what I will present uh, are results where we try to uh, somehow weaken all these assumptions or all the models that have, con have been considered so far and try to take random models where my length scales are only uh, respected under a certain, let's say in a certain average sense. So another way of like trying to, to rephrase this question is if I allow clusters in my geometry, right, because I'm allowing, for instance, to have some holes which are close to each other or big enough, and the capacity, I pre and I do preserve this quantity, so this limit of capacity, can I still have homogenization? Okay, so this is basically uh, the question I will try to answer today. Uh, before doing this, let me give you a bit more uh, heuristics on what are the different regimes and um, so how in some sense, I mean, what is like the difference between the different regimes of uh, distance epsilon, right? That's fixed or like we fix, we, we take epsilon as a distance. And then this was what I called in the previous slides, uh, a epsilon. So this is like, I'm assuming that the size of the holes is a certain power of epsilon. And now what you ask, I mean, what you can ask is what happens to the capacity for this different uh, family of, uh, of holes and how do I distinguish the different regimes, at least in a heuristic sense. So to do heuristics, let's, let's put ourselves in the easiest, let's say, case. So the case where my, so where the distribution of the holes is periodic. So basically, H epsilon could be written in this sense, right? So I have, I'm taking centers Z, which are in the lattice, and I'm rescaling them so that they have distance epsilon. And then I'm taking around each uh, periodic center uh, a ball of a certain radius. So R is just a fixed number. In principle, I could have also uh, taken it like one. And this is the scale. A epsilon, uh, sorry, um, epsilon to the alpha. Now, two things. Uh, if I am in R3, the capacity of a ball of radius R scales like the radius. 
And in general, it scales like D minus two. And another very basic observation, if I take a cube or any bounded set, basically, since I have holes which have a distance epsilon, the number of balls that fall into the set has order epsilon to the minus three in three dimensions. So this means that now if I'm looking at what I want to write, I mean, what I was looking at, what I want to look at is the density. It was this new alpha that I defined before, right? It was the limit for epsilon going to zero of the capacity of H epsilon A in R3. Now I'm looking at a particular case. So the case where A is the cube, unitary cube, let's say, and I look at this guy. Now, what is this guy? So basically, this capacity here is just the capacity of the holes that have centers inside the cube that I'm considering, and I'm taking the balls around it. So now I have a capacity of a union of sets. Now, the capacity is definitely subadditive. So the capacity of the union is always smaller or equal than the sum of the capacities. Moreover, in this case, what you have is that basically, at least for alphas bigger than one, the relative distance between two holes is getting larger and larger. So in other words, if I scale, rescale epsilon to be one, the size is shrinking. So here I do not only have an equality, an inequality, but that I do have an equality, at least in the limit, let's say. Because in some sense, the single sets of which I'm taking the union are getting more and more distant between each other. So the, the two capacities, they correlate in another word, in other, in other words. So basically, this is not only an inequality, but it becomes an equality. So I estimate the capacity of the union with the sum of the capacities. And now I use what I know here. So the capacity of balls scale like the radii. So this is giving me this term here. And now I'm summing epsilon to the minus three terms. So as you see here, this is the scaling that I expect for the density of the, for the capacity. So this means in particular that if I want, if I'm expecting some mu which is finite, so some limit which is finite, in this case, since I am kind of like behaving in an homogeneous way, my mu is a constant indeed. So it's not a, 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 much, a much worse object. So I need to ask that alpha equal to three. So I need to ask here that the size of the holes is epsilon to the three. So much, much smaller than the distance, which is epsilon. In order to have what I was calling Brinkman, right? Which is that in the, homogene in the um, homogenized limit, I have something of this form. And I need to put myself in the regime alpha in between one and three. If I expect that the capacity blows up and therefore after rescaling, I will have Darcy's law. So this is basically the heuristics which tells you how you pick the scaling here, the alpha here, and now according to alpha, you expect your limit operator to be. Now, this is the periodic case. So this is well understood and you can of course do all kinds of, cal 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 of uh, calculations here. So let me now tell you what we do. I mean, so how do you construct a first, let's say toy model for a random domain? Well, I mean, uh, it's not so, <laughs> it's nothing so uh, crazy or so original. Basically the way you want to do it is I still construct H epsilon as a union of sets of balls. But now my uh, centers are not anymore in the lattice, but are distributed according to a point process, basically, which I'm rescaling so that the average distance is epsilon. And my balls now have a certain radius, which is now of this form. So 
Rho Z is a random variable which is associated to my center and it's rescaled by epsilon alpha. So now basically, uh, instead of having this drawing here, a typical realization, let's say, of my uh, domain or my, of, my, of the holes, H epsilon is more of this form. So much more irregular in some sense and which with, let's say, as you see here, kinds of clusters of holes. More precisely, let me tell you more what are exactly the conditions. So uh, I assume indeed that I have random centers. So the Z or the phi here is a point process. In this talk, I would talk about a Poisson point process. This can be uh, changed and weakened. You don't need exactly that. Uh, there is a raise the hand. Yes, please. Uh, this is a short question just to understand. Sure. If mu happens to be plus infinity, does that mean the flow stops or something physically? Not really. I mean, if, so I will tell you the, the exact um, uh, statement uh, in the next slides, but basically it will mean that you need to, so you don't have viscosity in some sense. So your viscosity goes to zero. So you rescale, you need to rescale by a certain parameter your solution. And this solution now will converge to what I call UH. And this UH is basically M times UH satisfies uh, F minus the grid. Oh, sorry. F minus the grid into P. So this is telling you that actually you need to rescale your velocity and rescaling by something which blows up, as you see here. This will be a, a, a positive power. And this will converge to a solution of this kind. Yeah. So Thank another you. way of seeing it is since it's the Laplacian is uh, disappearing in the limit. So it's like you are taking something with, which has viscosity, which is going to zero. Okay. Uh, are there other questions or can I? Okay. Okay, so, right. So for this talk, I mean, I will consider basically centers which are Poisson distributed and where the random variables here are basically a collection of random variables indexed by the Zs in my point process. And with this, integrability assumptions. No, now let me just tell you that, and this is something that I will also say in the next slides. I mean, when you have alpha equal to three, so the case of Brinkman, right? So that was the case of this form. What you are assuming is simply that the first moment is bounded. So this is basically a quite low integrability assumption, as you see. I'm not even assuming that the, my uh, random variables have second moment, only the first moment uh, is needed. And indeed, I mean, in principle, I mean, they, they might really overlap. I might really have very big clusters. Uh, indeed, okay, as you, as you can see here, of course, the average radius is of order epsilon alpha, since I'm assuming that at least the first moment is bounded and the average distance is epsilon. So, in this case, the length scales are satisfied in an average sense. And in the next slide, indeed, like I will try to convince you that the moment condition that I have here is the minimal one that you have in order uh, to have that the, problems ma the problem makes sense. And at the same time, as I will, I will uh, try to, to prove and show in the theorem that uh, you have homogenization. So I will do this for alpha equal to three, and then the rest, I mean, is similar. So in the case alpha equal to three, uh, this was the assumption, right? So I'm assuming that my centers are Poisson distributed and that my random variables are IID. This is also not strictly needed, but I mean, it's a simple, simpler and uh, somehow meaningful case. Um, and I'm assuming here, as you see, only that the first moment is bounded. So what does it imply? 
Uh, so, okay, this is what I said before, right? That the length scale epsilon and epsilon to the three are typical in the average sense. And it implies also only the first moment that the capacity, the limit of the capacity is constant. So why is that? Well, let's try to do the same uh, basically argument or the same calculation that we did in the periodic case. So again, I'm taking the cube. I'm looking at the capacity of holes inside the cube. So this was, we said, right, this is like basically the centers which fall in the, the point process and inside this rescale domain, right? Because that's equivalent to say that epsilon to the Z, sorry, epsilon times Z is in the, in the QQ. And I'm taking holes of this form. Uh, sorry, there is a Z. Now, you do again the same uh, calculation. At least for the upper bound, you can still say that the capacity is subadditive. So you control this union with the sum. You will be able, I mean, after working a bit, to prove that this is also an equality again. So what do you have? Sorry, that's epsilon to the three. So you have again the same, that this is the sum of the capacities, the capacity scale like epsilon three rho z. So you have rho z and you have epsilon three. But now this quantity here, even though you have like that you're not in the periodic case and all of this, I mean, all these radii are different. This is just basically an average sum of IID random variables. And now you use a very, I mean, basic result from probability, which is the strong law of large numbers. So what you know is that for every realization of my set, so not even in probability, not even in an average sense, when I take the limit of this capacity, this converges to a fixed constant, which is the same for every realization. So this would be my new basic. Okay, so basically this model here is telling you that I have a limit of the capacity, so I should expect homogenization. And of course, I'm very far away from what was in the existing literature. Because of course, I have many overlapping holes. Actually, by a, a scaling argument or a, the, using again the strong law of large numbers, one can show that the number of overlapping holes is of order basically epsilon to the minus one over epsilon to the minus three holes. So the drawing that you saw uh, in the previous slide, which showed like many holes which are close to each other and which might create clusters is really the typical realization. Uh, so in other words, basically this condition here, which is the minimal one, right? That you need in order to have that this, this exists almost surely is minimal for having finite capacity because if I don't have first moment, uh, this is exploding basically. And I am in the case alpha equal to three, remember? Uh, however, I am really in the case where I do have clusters. So I am very far away from the periodic case or the case where I have minimal distance and an upper bound on the size. So, and uh, let me also mention, and maybe I didn't say that, okay, that uh, in the case alpha between one and three, so that would be the case of Darcy, what you can show is this is also, is that this condition is also minimal in the sense that having this finite basically implies that the epsilon is non-empty, um, almost surely for small epsilon, basically. So in other words, uh, if I do not assume that this moment is finite, then I'm creating holes which are too big and which, some, which almost surely, so for, almost every realization, they do go and cover my domain. So I'm basically solving the PD in the empty set. So this is really also in this case, the condition, the minimal condition that uh, allows my problem to have a meaning to basically solve it in a domain which is non-empty. So these are basically, therefore, I mean, our models, random models, which are uh, 
similar to the periodic case, but which have very different properties and which requires a different manipulation and a different technique to prove homogenization. But this is, however, the, um, basically the results that we show. So we show, in other words, that nothing changes from the periodic case. So we have the following. So let's say that we have the previous um, random case. So the random setting that I've just introduced. We are in the Brinkman regime. So where I'm basically rescaling by epsilon to the three, the holes. Then for P almost every realization of the whole. So this is an almost sure result. This problem here converges to this problem here. And in this sense, so the solution converges weakly in H10 to the solution of this problem here. And as you see here, now this is my mu because this is basically the average capacity generated by one hole. And a similar thing, uh, of course, holds for Stokes. So if you put instead of Laplace and Stokes, you will get a Brinkman term of this form. So it will be similar to this. So it will be six pi lambda, uh, the expectation of rho times the identity this time because you, you have a matrix instead of a scalar. And then there is also a similar thing that is true in the Darcy case. So this is the, the case and the regime where I have a blow up of the capacity. Uh, and again, also in this case, for almost a realization of the holes, this converges to this in this sense. So if I rescale by this uh, factor here, my solution, alpha is smaller than three. So this is uh, something which blows up. This converges weakly in this space here to the solution of this equation here. And, and similar, I mean, same thing holds in the case of Stokes for the analog problem. Okay, so basically what this result tells you is that in the end, I mean, even though you have all this clustering phenomena, since you are preserving the capacity, you do not have any problem. Okay, I'm very late, so <laughs> I need to like uh, speed it up. Um, so I will try to give you a very brief sketch of uh, how to prove this. I mean, what are the main ideas? So, and I will do this for uh, alpha equal to three. So what I'm about to say, at least the first part comes from this famous paper by Choranescu Mura, where this problem for the Laplacian is proved basically in the periodic case. So we have um, this problem here, right? And we want to show the theorem. So we want to show that this, uh, there is a limit and the limit solves the right equation. So the first thing, I mean, which is compactness in this kind of problems and basically in this kind of homogenization problems, it's not uh, an issue. So you immediately have it because uh, I can immediately test my equation with U epsilon itself. And I do get the following energy estimate. So this means that, as I was saying before, I'm extending U epsilon to be zero inside the hole. So this is a uniform estimate in H10. So I have up to subsequences so far, uh, a candidate limit. So compactness, I mean, in this problem is immediate. It's really like one line property. And now of course the problem is how do I identify you? So how do I show that uh, I, if I use this equation, I use this convergence, I get the equation for you. So now what is the problem here? I mean, the, the problem here is very basic. So what I would like to do, right, is to, find some suitable test functions, test the equation here for u epsilon and then pass to the limit. However, the suitable test function, I mean, the, the admissible spaces for these problems are of this form. And as you see here, when epsilon changes, so if I have epsilon one, let's say, and I have the space for epsilon two, there are no relationship between the this domain here and this domain here. And therefore there is no relationship between this space here and this space here. So they are not nested, for instance, when epsilon changes and there is no relation between these spaces here. So now the point is if my domains are changing, so the, the test functions, the space of test function is changing, is changing with epsilon, how do I deal with this? And the idea is not hard. I mean, the idea is, at least one of the ways of treating this problem is via what is called oscillating test function. 
And now, how does it work? Well, basically, the idea is I take any test function for the, uh, um, let's say, the limit problem, right? So in the full domain without holes, what I try to do now is to construct a way to transform it in such a way that this is now admissible in the space for the problem, let's say, of u epsilon. So now this is h10 in the epsilon. So how do I do this? The basic way is like this. So I just take rho and I multiply by another function, which I call it oscillating test function, which should make this rho epsilon belong to the space. So what are the properties? Well, of course, in order to, for the function to belong to the space, my function needs to take care of the presence of the holes. So this function here needs to vanish on the holes. So in particular, I need to ask that this W epsilon vanishes on the holes. This is, of course, the first question, the first property that I need. And then, of course, I need something else. So I need that in order for this to be a correction. So, right, I mean, I want to pass, I want to test this with the equation, and then I want to pass to the limit. So what I want is that in the limits, epsilon going to zero, this goes to the original function in some sense. So what I want is that actually this correction here goes to one and weekly in H1, that's, that suffices. And then what you can try to do is to try to test this problem here with rho epsilon. And now what you get here is that actually, so if you test, sorry, that's W epsilon times rho epsilon. So if you only assume these two uh, properties here, and you also know this, you can pass to the limit here. So you will find F, sorry, that's times rho. So F times rho. And then you will have from this, the following terms. Uh, there is a W epsilon here, then there is a rho W epsilon U epsilon. Now, this is not a problem because you have strong convergence on the W epsilon because that's weak in H1 and weak convergence here. So here you can pass to the limit. And here you recover what would be the Laplacian term. So that converges to this, sorry. But then here you want to pass to the limit. And here it's a problem, right? Because here you have weak convergence and weak convergence. So you can't pass to the limit in principle. So you need to get, so you need to ask more on this oscillating test function. And the way to treat this is to ask something more on the W epsilon, which uh, to make it very brief, basically means that I want to say that the Laplace, sorry, the, the L2 norm of the gradient of W epsilon locally behaves like the capacity density. So, and the way you do this is in the periodic case is easy because you, you have per, per basically cell problems. So you construct your oscillating test function in this way here. So you ask it to be zero in the hole, you ask it to be one in the ball of radius epsilon now, and you take the harmonic extension. And in other words, this is, I mean, from what you, what I also said at the beginning on the, for the capacity, this is the capacity of this hole here in this hole here. So your that oscillated test function is basically something which locally looks like the capacitary function of all the holes. Now, let me just conclude. Of course, uh, I don't give you the, the details. Unfortunately, I'm uh, kind of out of time. So this is not doable anymore if you have clusters, of course, uh, but you can still use the similar idea. So I want to still construct an oscillating test function. And now the very basic idea is simple. So you say, okay, I have my holes and I want to try to divide them into a part which is good, which I call good holes and a part which is bad. So the good holes are the ones where my scaling is respected. So epsilon to the three behaves like epsilon to the three or actually at least behaves like, so it's smaller, let's say smaller than epsilon. So in other words, the scalings 
are kind of respected. Distance is kind of size epsilon and size is not necessarily epsilon to the three, but is separate. And then I have the bad holes and the bad holes are where I clustered. So basically, roughly is when epsilon to the three is at least epsilon. So when rho is really big, so it's like epsilon to the minus two. And now what you want to try to do is to say, okay, I treat the case of the good holes. I construct the oscillating test function as in the periodic case. Of course, it's not really the same, but you can still, since they are separated, you can still construct some kind of cells. They are not periodic, but you can still do the same that you did in the periodic. Now you need to take care of the clusters. How do you take care of the clusters? The thing that you want to do is to show that you can choose the clusters in a good way, in such a way that they are separated from the good hole. So, and here, and I will stop, is that you want to construct a nice, what is called safety layer, which encloses the clusters and which has the following property. So the distance between the good holes and the cluster, actually the safety layer, sorry, not the cluster, is again of order epsilon. So this safety layer is quite attached to the clusters, but it's not too attached because they want that the capacity of the bed set, so the cluster inside the safety layer is again scaling like the capacity of the cluster in the full set. And this basically allows me to separate the two problems and treat the, bad, the good holes as the periodic case and the bad holes in a, let's say, implicit way by just taking the capacitary function. Quick, and this is the last thing. So why is this need, why is this enough? Because you can show that if I take just the capacitary function on the clusters, its contribution goes to zero because the capacity of the clusters might be very bad but it's again a union of holes. I control it by the sum of the single capacities. And these are only the, the centers which fall in the bad holes. So the centers for which the radius is at least epsilon to the minus two. But this is uh, never a sum of these four. And if I have first moment bounded and I'm asking that I have a lower bound which goes to infinity, this guy here goes to zero, no matter how the clusters look like. So this idea basically allows you to combine things and treat also the cases of clusters and prove basically homogenization. And with this, I had like some other comments. Of course, I'm happy to answer uh, like <laughs> to the Darcy's case and the Stokes case, what happens, uh, but I'm out of time and I apologize for that. And I thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ariana, for the, for the talk. Uh, I, th I think it was uh, very clear. I see several people applauding. Uh, now we have the virtual applause, right? So, uh, I mean, if uh, there are is somebody who has any questions, uh, you I, I was since we are not so many, we you can just unmute yourself and uh, and ask uh, Gregorio. I I see that. Go ahead, Gregorio. Unmute yourself and. Yes. Thank you. Hi. This was Hi. a very nice talk. Thank you. So you have three questions. Um, so the first one, can, can your result say something about, for instance, if you take a Brownian motion in your domain D epsilon, or can you get convergence to some kind of Brownian motion with an effective diffusivity or something like that? Yes, yes, yes. So another way of seeing this, uh, let me go to the result. Um, here. Yes, another way of seeing this, oh, sorry. Yes, as you said, I mean, you can see this as a, I'm taking a Brownian motion and I am, I have basically a Brownian motion among traps. So my right. holes now are traps. And what happens is that if my uh, Brownian motion touches the trap, it, it gets killed. So, this convergence here, so this would be the generator of your process, and you show that basically it converges to the generator of another Brownian motion, where you have basically a, basically this is represented like it's a kind of cutoff, which tells you that exponentially uh, you expect, you, you cut off your Brownian motion when you are at a certain, as a certain size. 
And this term here represents the average waiting time that you need to that you that you have before your Brownian motion gets killed. Oh, it's a kill Brownian motion. So yes, I see. I see. So basically, in other words, sorry, please. Yeah, yeah. You go ahead, please. Yes, in other words, this is like basically how also is related to the scale at which you expect that your Brownian motion arrives before it gets killed. And then you have exponentially small probability to be outside of that ball. And, it's, and if it's a Brownian motion with um, reflections or something like that, do you get something? So that would be, so that would be like a, a Neumann, right? Right. And then you do, you do have a very different uh, behavior because then, as you said, uh, you don't have any more this kind of um, homogenization equation, but you do get, you might have a change in the diffusivity here. Right. So you might have, I mean, in the case of Neumann, what you have, at least in certain cases, for certain regimes, this is true, you have that you converge to a problem of this size in the in the oh i see so and here the, i mean exactly as you said here i mean you're not killing you are reflecting so you are changing the diffusivity of your brownian motion that's nice and the second question is that you somehow you kill all the randomness for instance you have this non percolation uh, uh, condition on the size of the of the ready uh, is there some kind of intermediate regime or critical regime where you get a random geometry in the in the limit? So, uh, can you repeat what you said? Sorry. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, you have the the condition on the moments of the radius that makes so somehow that you don't have percolation in the limit, in some sense, but then. Is there any scale where your obstacle in the limit are non-vanishing? I mean, they are random objects. Okay. Um, so let's say one thing that you can do is to go to the fluctuations, for instance. Yeah. And then in the fluctuations, you might find something of this form. This is not a proof. This is what you would expect. Where this is now white noise, right? Are there results on, on this? Um, not that I know of. I see. I see. There might be some old papers uh, related mostly to Stokes, maybe where there are similar results, but I, I, I can't tell you now. I will send you a um, message. Maybe we can discuss sure. this. Uh, I have a, a third question, which is really naive because I'm not, uh, I don't know this uh, capacity um, yes. technology. So is it possible to rewrite your boundary problem as a Laplacian plus a distribution value uh, potential and then yeah. work the convergence at that level? Do, would you bypass all these capacity arguments? Um. So definitely you can write, I mean, you can write this and, and then you need to put, so there is a way of, of doing this. So uh, like, let's say the physical, one of the, um, the, the physical way of approaching this problem is what you said. So it's saying, okay, uh, in some sense, like from the physical point of view, right? You're looking at the electric potential basically uh, in a part, and, and you are like looking at charges in other words. So your, your holes now, they represent charges. And then what you say is, I try to replace this by something of this form. I want to put basically certain waste here. And on the right hand side, I put like something which is supported around the hole. So, or and the, the real problem here would be if you have something, I mean, you need to, to, to add like, so this is exactly the same problem that you had before. If you want to, to remove like the, the zero boundary condition and extend the Laplacian to the full set. 
So definitely your problem can be written as the Laplace equal to a right hand side, which is the distribution. Uh, but then when you want to treat the convergence, uh, you end up with uh, having capacity arguments in some sense, because the, 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 the thing be, be, be behind, let's say, the capacity is really just the fact that I'm, I'm trying to understand what it means, what is the cost that I pay when I ask my function to be zero in the small holes and to be and to solve or to be harmonic outside of them. So in some sense, it's not you, you can avoid phrasing it as a capacity problem, but the scaling of the capacity is what appears. I see. I'm not sure I answered your question, okay. but yeah, no, I was thinking, but because yeah, the, this is very PDE in the space you use. So I was thinking that maybe if you rephrase it, you can use some further space, you know, some technologies that come more from probability and uh, so rephrase the problem. But yeah, I see it. Of course, it's not immediate. Yeah, it's, I see. Yeah, Thank I you. mean, it's uh, yeah. No, Thank I mean, I'm, I'm not claiming, uh, I think there is like, for instance, there is a, a way of like trying to approximate this problem by a problem of this form and trying to find what are the charges QI that you need to put in order to have zero here. And then you okay. will find out that the way of choosing the charges will give you the limit equation. So this is a, a multiple basically kind of uh, approach. This is more ah, physical okay. than probability. Okay. This is another way you can go without using the oscillating test function. For right. Instance. right. But again, when you do all these arguments, I mean, the scaling behind it is scaling of the capacity. So there is always the capacity which plays the role. That's right. That was a very, it was a very nice talk because if you can write it, you know, with the distribution value potential, maybe you could you know, use a common space for all the for all test functions and somehow show distribution conversion for the potential. It is true, but it is also true that your potential depends on you itself, right? So that's true. Right. Yeah. So so you, you, it's you, I mean you're totally right when you say that I, I can extend everything to the full space. So I don't have to pay the price of working with different test functions. But then I have to pay another price of having a right hand side which is irregular and where you have the dependence on you. So it's not really of the form equal to xi or whatever. So right. it would be more for right. xi of you. That's true. Okay. Thank you very much. No worries. Okay. So I, I also have a question uh, because uh, uh, I think uh, there were some papers of Murat uh, and somebody who uh, maybe cut Katsimi, Katsimi, uh, something like that. I don't know. Ah, Katsimi. Yeah, yeah. That later on they are trying to find, uh, they take the, they say, so they have a deterministic setup. So they are trying to say the, uh, what you call W epsilon times rho uh, is pretty close to actually the solution U epsilon. And then they can estimate that difference so they have yeah. this row that is a solution to the homogenized equation times something yeah. else, some filter that they apply, and they yes. estimate the distance between these. Yes. Uh, in a stronger norm, right? They, they, that one is, you, you can uh, believe that is closer yes. in the stronger norm. So, so I was wondering, uh, in this case, uh, uh, in the random case, uh, does it also work? I imagine it would Yes. So this is basically this paper here. Ah, yeah, <laughs> okay. So yeah, yeah, no, this is a good point because I mean, what I said so far is, or, is only qualitative, right? I just showed that you have a convergence. I didn't give you a rate. And as you said, I mean, uh, in the periodic case, right, I mean, if you, indeed, so right now you only know that you have weak convergence, but as you said, exactly. So if I take now U epsilon and then I, substitute not on, I'm, I'm sorry, I subtract not only the homogenized solution, but a corrector, basically a corrected uh, homogenized solution. So I'm multiplying by the oscillating test function that I had before. Now, the gradient of this thing, so while this was only 
weakly convergent, uh, this goes to zero and it's bounded by epsilon basically. And I mean, you can do a similar thing here. Uh, of course, um, so how can I explain this to you? So uh, I only, so in my case, I only, remember that I only assumed that the first moment is finite. So I think it's pretty like reasonable to imagine that if I want to quantify the convergence, I need to quantify how uh, my density of capacity converges to what I was calling mu. So I need to give a rate to that convergence. If I want to give a rate to that convergence, for instance, I need to tell you how the bad clusters go to zero, for instance, one of the many things that I need to quantify. So here, as you see, I'm saying, okay, I take basically this is an average sum of rho z, and then I'm cutting them with something which goes to infinity. So since the first moment is bounded, this goes to zero. In order to quantify this, I need a bit more here. So the result that basically um, I have is that if you assume this plus a certain alpha, then you have u epsilon minus w epsilon, u h norm h10 is bounded by a certain beta, which will depend on how much, how, let's say, how, how well you control the integrability, the stochastic integrability of your radar. So this is somehow the, let's say, analog of this Kachimi Mura in this case. Let me also say, to be fair, that I'm not expecting in that paper, um, so in my paper, uh, that the estimates that I get are optimal. So I'm not expecting that those are the optimal um, error estimates, but you can quantify the convergence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> may, may, may I, Mircea, may I ask something? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, in, in uh, I mean, in this, uh, this, uh, this strange term coming from nowhere that you put like this in the literature, uh, when you are in the deterministic case, okay, it arises, uh, it's more or less understood that if the, if the holes do not intersect, you will have this capacity subadditivity, right? But if you have this uh, Boolean model or however you call it with the random radius and so all that, how you do deal with that difficulty eventually? That, that was in the last uh, slide that you didn't show or something like that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you mean in the case of Stokes or uh, so? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I maybe... mean, you have a you have a slide that you I mean maybe because of time you were not able to explain us. Yeah. 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 Okay. Just let me let me briefly comment. So in the case of the Laplacian, the sub the capacity that you are looking at is the um, electric electrostatic capacity, the harmonic capacity. So there you have subadditivity. So this is what I do here. So I do okay. I, I say, mean, but, 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 very... but, but, but you have subadditivity because the, the the holes do not intersect, right? No, I mean, no, no, I, I no, mean, no. No, no. I have the I have the, the capacity of the union of any set is bounded by the sum of the capacities. This is true no matter how the sets are. This is uh... the subadditive. I'm not but... asking that it's exactly equal. Um, right. Um, I mean, but, but but the capacity is not like the capacity of A union B less than the capacity of A intersection B is less than the sum of the capacities or something like that. Anyway, you have this right or something like that. Yeah. So no, no, I think you you to have that equality, you need something like this. And now I I have to remember, but it's uh, cup A. Uh, plus cap B, and here you have something like this. The intersection, yeah. Yes, but on this side, right? So, so this implies in particular that the capacity of A union B is more or equal than the sum of the capacity. Sure, sure, but if you have some intersection, I mean, your, 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 your strange term appearing from nowhere will not be a good approximation to this, or will it anyway? No, it will anyway. Okay, uh, let me, maybe I add a page, sorry. No, 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 yes, okay. So it will anyway, because 
very heuristically, so what do I have? So I have, I'm looking at the capacity, let's say in a set. This is what I did before. So now remember that my set is divided into good holes and bad holes. So basically the way I construct this is that the two sets get quite separated. So I can say that, or maybe the easiest way would be, I tell you that I have the capacity of H intersected the good holes. This is smaller, sorry, let me say Q, than the capacity of Q intersected with all the holes. This is just because I'm taking more holes inside here. And by subadditivity again, this is the capacity of Q intersected with the good holes plus capacity of Q intersected with the bad holes. Okay, do you agree with this? I do. Okay, now uh, the good thing about, I mean, they are good, these holes, because here I can basically say, so these are things which do kind of respect my scaling. So this is really the sum. So they are separated and they, they are small enough, the holes, in order to say that this is basically the sum of the Z in the good holes, so good, epsilon to the three rows of Z, only the ones which are good. And now I'm saying that this is, bound, this is bounding from below this, And again, I mean, for the good holes, I can, I can again replace this. Oh, sorry, I have. Sorry. Okay. Uh, Rosette, so is that good? Anyway, this is the details are in your in your paper, right? I don't want to. Yes. To, okay. But no, no. But uh, I'm done. So basically, and then you will have. I mean, you're left with this capacity of the bad holes. Now, what I'm claiming is that just by subadditivity, so here I only use subadditivity, this goes to zero. And these, of course, are average sums, so they go to the exact right uh, quantity. And this is in the middle. So I'm basically telling you that the clusters do not matter, and the good holes are giving me sure. exactly this. Yeah, yeah, that was my question. Yeah. So just to be very quick, okay. In the case of Stokes, you don't have this subadditivity. So there you really have to suffer much more because you have the divergence free constraint, right? So I cannot say anymore. I mean, what I'm doing is like, I'm taking vector fields and the divergence free constraint tells me that I'm, I need to squeeze them. So if I have two holes which are closed, it's not like taking one and taking the other. So there, what we need to do is actually to work more on the geometry of the clusters. So there I cannot say, oh, I don't care how the clusters are and I, I just use subadditivity. This is indeed true because I, so I, I cheated a bit. <laughs> so in the, the case of Stokes, the condition that I assume is this. So it's like any power bigger than the minimal condition. And this allows me by percolation argument to control what happens for the clusters in a very, yes. It was a very nice talk, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, okay. So thank you very much, uh, Ariana. I think uh, uh, we are, uh, we have make you stay up enough uh, talking and now it's- uh, No eight, worries. <laughs> 8 p.m. there, half past 8 p.m. Um, yeah, so thank you very much. It was very nice uh, to hear about this. And... Thank you, Ariana, and sorry for interrupting you very ah, often. No worries so at all. I think it delayed you a little bit. I'm sorry. No, no, no.